Good evening, everyone. Let's take our hymnals or your song sheets. Turn to number 72 as we stand and sing, My Savior, First of All. Number 72 as we stand and sing. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, the bright and glorious morning I shall see. I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know luster of his kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city, in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. Song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. Good to see you tonight. Hope you've gotten off to a good start this week. Praising the Lord. Uh, we're good shape for the shape we're in. Amen. You're here. You can still come to church. We don't know how much longer they're going to let us do that legally, but we'll, we'll just keep doing it anyway and just ask the Lord to bless in a tremendous way. I started out the service this morning by saying, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, but, that's the next word, but, there's just a lot of funny things going on, aren't there? The thing is, we can all speculate, and you've got your speculations, and I've got mine, and one of us is bound to be right. <laughs> Isn't that right? We do know this, though. Things, things are not on the up and up. That's right. And that's pretty obvious through this whole thing. But none of it has the Lord in a panic. Man, he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's still on his throne. They're never going to knock him off of it. And we have a privilege to serve him in this hour, in all history, right here in this hour. What an opportunity. So we're going to get some things from the Word of God tonight that I trust will be a blessing to your heart. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you. We're thanking you that you are our God. Now, Father, you ro rule over all the affairs of men. There's no conspiracy on this planet that's so strong they can outdo our God and, uh, and topple you, Father, can't happen. So we're just rejoicing tonight that you are our God. And we look to you for eternal truths from your word that will help us in our lives and in our daily walk. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in every life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to number 25, the wonder of it all. Number 25. There's the wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder at sunrise I see. But the 
wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. The There is a fountain, number 41.
Now I'm on. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we're going to have the thing ready for an early drive-in service this coming Sunday. So we'll do our regular service at 845 and then repeat it again at 1045. Of course, the only service that goes over the air, as far as the Internet's concerned, will be the 1045 service and then the 6 o'clock service in the evening. I'm hoping now that within two weeks we'll be able to do uh, drive-in service, and we'll start it nice and early. It gets warm pretty early. And, uh, but you'll be in your air-conditioned cars, and so that'll be nice. And we'll probably do it out here in this parking lot. If we do it over here, a bunch of people are going to have to be looking into the sun. And so if we do it over here, it shouldn't be a problem that early in the morning. And we'll do that service and a 1045 service. But just pay attention to that. won't be this week. But that's what we're planning on doing. Right now, we're still planning on starting school. And uh, I noticed that the area public schools are planning on, uh, for the first quarter, uh, going on studying at home. And I'll guarantee you that's not going to be a whole lot of learning going on there. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And you're going to find a greater difference between some children who have parents that actually care enough to see to it their kids get it done and those poor kids that have parents that don't even pay attention. So uh, it's, it's going to be a tough thing. But we're going to try to have ours on the uh, starting on the 19th of August. We're going to be having a meeting next week to discuss some of the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, I also need to mention this coming Sunday night, in the two Sunday night services, uh, we've we got to have a brief business meeting. There are just a couple of things we need to take care of. And so at the end of the 4 o'clock service, we've got a couple of things that we'll give to you and uh, we need to vote on. And then we will carry that over to after the 6 o'clock service so the people in that service can vote on it too. We've not had to do it that way in the past, but we're going to do, do it. I mean, let's face it, we're doing a whole lot of things like we've never had to do them before. Okay, let's sing some more. Number 60, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Number 60. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to needs go on in the blood sprinkled way the path that the Savior trod if I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as I hold Seven, wounded for me.
took on the likeness of man. He came to live in an ungodly world, though spotless the Lamb knew no sin. All heaven's foundations were shaken that day, but for changing his mind he would not. Though he knew exactly what he would go through, Oh, he must have loved me a lot. And how many tears have I brought to his eyes? I've heard him more often than not. Still infinite mercy responds to my cry. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. of death and the grave. He went through the pain of denial and scorn, the outcast and beggar to save. If I had the power to turn back the time, make amends for the things I forgot, a lifetime of goodness could never atone. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. brought to his eyes, I've heard him more often than not. Still infinite mercy responds to my cry, oh, he must have loved me a lot. And how many tears have I brought to his eyes, I've heard him more often than not. Still infinite mercy responds to my cry, Oh, he must have loved me a lot. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. Love me a lot. All right. Thank you for that, Brooks family. We appreciate that. You're going to be turning to Psalm 120. Psalm 120. And meanwhile, let me mention, we do have the offering boxes in the back that you can just drop those things in, uh, your offerings. And uh, for those of you who uh, like to give the Lighthouse Baptist Ministries, you can do that as well. Just make sure you mark it so, otherwise it just goes into the regular offering. It's backwards on the way that we've normally done it on Wednesdays, but it's a little more difficult to separate everything. So if you're putting something in the offering plate for Lighthouse, please mark it so that they get it, all right? Now tonight, we're going to try to preach on three psalms at one time, uh, Psalm 120, 121, and 122. You remember a few months ago now, we started going through the psalms, and going through psalms in particular that I have not preached much from in the last 30 years. And I, I wanted want to pick up on some of those psalms, because for some, it's been quite a while since, I, since I've preached on them, and we've cover, uh, covered a number of them in the last uh, five weeks, uh, six weeks, uh, we have been looking at the miktams of David. We started out with Psalm 16, 
all by itself, a miktam of David is what it says. And then you go over to Psalm 56 on through Psalm 60, you've got five more miktams of David. And we find David in those in trouble a lot and having to trust the Lord. Now tonight, what we're going to deal with are songs of degrees. Songs of degrees. There are 15 of them in the book of Psalms. I'm not saying we're going to preach on all 15 of them, but I wanted to cover the first three together of those 15. Now, of these Psalms, four of them, it is stated clearly that they were written by David. One of them was written by Solomon. There are some people who feel that Hezekiah wrote some of the other Psalms, but there's absolutely no biblical record to let us know that. As a matter of fact, in some of the Psalms, uh, like for instance in Psalm 120 and 121 that just simply start out a song of degrees, it reads an awful lot like David. But don't let that throw you because the Holy Spirit's the author of all the Bible. And he wrote particular parts of the scripture with a particular thing in mind. And if it sounds like somebody else that he used, well, maybe that the similarity is not David himself, but the Holy Spirit of God himself. That's the important thing that we need to understand. Now, I'm just going to read Psalm 120 to start us, but we're going to cover uh, all of these verses down through Psalm 122 and verse 9. Notice he says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I do pray that you would take these words and deal with our hearts. Lord, help us, teach us how to live in the present day in which we live. And to perhaps even understand, give us some understanding about these days and what's going on. But most importantly... May we look to you in all that may come our way in the days that are ahead. For you are our shade and our shield. God, have your way in our lives and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Psalm 120, as I said, begins uh, a number of psalms, 15 psalms, that have the heading, A Song of Degrees. Many are divided over what uh, that expression means. Some have suggested that it means a song of a higher choir or done in a higher key. It may have to do with stages of the journey back to the promised land from the captivity after the dispersion. Some believe that it's prophetic in nature, referring to the final ingathering in a coming day of the Jewish exiles from the dispersion. And by the way, may I say that there are a number of prophetic scriptures in the Bible that deal with a very recent incident and also a future incident incident or something that's going to take place in Old Testament times and also will take place in New Testament times. Like for instance, when you start talking about the abomination of desolation, is first pictured for us in about 163 BC when Antio um, Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple and sacrificed the pig and declared himself God. We also know that the Antichrist is going to do that same thing as he's going to lift himself up as God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the Lord Jesus referred to that abomination of desolation as well. But anyway, perhaps these songs are related in some way to the restoration of the ark. Now, I'm not talking about Noah's ark, but the ark to the city of Jerusalem. Now, there are other commentators. Now, you read on this, it's amazing some of the different things that people come up with. I guess I have to think real hard to come up with this stuff. But others say that these 15 psalms refer to 15 stages in the annual ascent to Jerusalem by the tribes and their periodic pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Some carried a little further. They say that these songs were sung on the steps of the temple. Now, there would be 15 steps. We know in Ezekiel's temple that's going to be at Jerusalem during the time of the millennium. All we have to do is simply read the description of the temple that Ezekiel talks about. Uh, that will be there for the millennial kingdom. There are 15 steps in that. However, there's no mention in Scripture 
as to how many steps there were going up to Solomon's temple. So somebody could say there's 15 and say, see, that matches these. But you don't find any biblical record that says there's 15. There might be. And maybe they sung each individual song when they got to each step. But we don't know that. And I got news for you. Whenever we're speculating outside the scripture, what seems good to us may not be the way that it is. So you take it with a grain of salt, okay? Now, with that in mind, there are some who want to link these psalms to Hezekiah uh, and his healing. You remember he was healed and given 15 more years to live. As a matter of fact, John Phillips, the author, he spends a lot of time in his commentary on the psalms, linking these psalms, all 15 of them, to the time of Hezekiah. I have trouble with that simply because David wrote four of them and he lived well over 200 years before Hezekiah came along. Solomon also wrote one of them. So he, he lived almost 200 years before Hezekiah came along. But nevertheless, here's what David Phillips suggests. He says that uh, the sign given by the prophet that the sundial would go back 10 degrees. He gets stuck on that word degrees because we find that it's used six times in 2 Kings chapter 20 and five times in Isaiah chapter 38. And for the numerologist, I'm sure the number 11 has some specific meaning. It's neither 15 nor is it 10. But they would say that the 15 Psalms of degrees correspond to the 15 years of added life that Hezekiah had. Now, are you dizzy yet? Okay, I've given you all these speculations and it's funny, depending on who different people read after, they come to a firm conclusion that this must be so and that must be so. But just stick with the scripture. Just stick with the scripture. And I look at it and I say, well, that's interesting. And that's interesting. That's interesting. I've had people before in the ministry tell me that they died. And that while they were dead, they saw, they got to see heaven. I'm out of people, and they're excited about it. Now, if I saw heaven, I think I'd be excited about it. But they're excited about it. And I said, really, tell me what you saw. And listen, as long as they didn't see anything that contradicted Scripture, maybe they did. I don't know. I mean, good night. How do you know? The Lord knows, doesn't he? That's enough for me. I'm not going to build any doctrine on their vision. Say amen right there. We get our doctrine from the Word of God. Amen? All right. All right. Now. In uh, some commentators link these into five groups of three. And they basically feel that the three, and we can see it in the first three Psalms, how they seem to go together. Psalm 120, 121, and 122. And they say there are five groups of three. And the first one in the group basically states the trouble that the psalmist is in. And then the second one in the group talks about trust. Their trust in the Lord while they're in the trouble. And then the third one in the group talks about triumph, what they're expecting, what's going to happen uh, because they put their trust in the Lord. And there's a sense in which we see that. Now remember, the first two of these are unnamed. And the third one is a song of degrees of David. But we're going to use that outline with the first one dealing with trouble. The second one, dealing with a statement of trust. And then the third one, the triumph that we can have in our lives. Trouble comes in our lives. And we shouldn't be under the burden to where we cannot rejoice in the Lord. Life's full of troubles. Every group of people that have lived have had to go through troubles in any place. The church has had to go through troubles. A lot of Christians have suffered martyrdom over the years. That's not been an uncommon thing. I'm reading a book right now on Stanley and Livingston and just seeing what Dr. Livingston, uh, David Livingston went through, not only in trying to reach uh, the natives of Africa back then in the 1800s, in the middle of the 1800s, but also his, his de devout hatred for the slave trade that he saw firsthand and all that he did to try to fight it and the deprivations that he went through. I mean, to do the things that he did, he had to give up years, I mean years upon years from family, from friends, to where even back home in England, people heard several times that he had died, only to find out later that he hadn't died. But the deprivation that he went through is absolutely amazing. 
So notice, first of all, in these psalms, number one, we're going to look at this matter of troubles. In Psalm 120, he says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. How many times have we read that in David's psalms? Have we been going through the psalms? When in distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Buddy, whenever you're in distress, that shouldn't be the last place you go to. That ought to be the first place you go to. And we find the psalmist here going to the Lord. I'm in trouble. Now, what kind of trouble is he in? You'll notice it says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Now, this is a hard trouble. You know, the truth is, words can wound a whole lot more than guns and spears and knives and swords. Tongues can destroy a person. As a matter of fact, things that are stated on the internet about people have led people to commit suicide. Have you heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's a lie. They hurt, and they hurt deep. And they hurt long. And by the way, when you've been serving the Lord and you have a good name and somebody starts a lie, how in the world do you defend yourself? How do you prove you didn't do something 30 years ago? I mean, I'm still amazed that when Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh, that he actually had his schedule for dates 35 years ago. I couldn't tell you what I was doing on any date 35 years ago. Matter of fact, I've got now, so I have trouble telling you what I did last night. That's amazing to me. But you'll notice as he says here, deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Now, deceit, you'll remember, is part of that all unrighteousness. In Romans chapter 1, when he says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And then beginning in verse 29, when he talks about all unrighteousness and he mentions fornication and things like that, he also mentions deceit. In Galatians chapter 5, when he talks about the works of the flesh, one of the works of the flesh is deceit. Now, deceit is not telling an outright lie. Deceit is getting people to believe a lie without you actually telling a lie. And boy, that's what people like to hide behind. Well, I didn't say he did it. I'm just telling you that I've heard this and you can make up your own mind. And boy, that can be enough to destroy a good testimony right there. The deceitful tongue. But there was a lying tongue. So we got two different things. We got lying. We got deceit. A clear untruth and trying to get people to believe an untruth. When I think of what that does to a person, all I have to do is think to James chapter 3. And the power of the tongue in James chapter 3 to destroy. And boy, does it ever destroy. I'm reminded of the illustration how one tree can make a million matches. And one match can destroy a million trees. One word. That mouth can spew out millions of words. But one word the wrong way can destroy a host of good people. One word. I know you read any of the books about different wars. I think about the World War II. There's a book about uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. And their, it wasn't their spy networks, but their secret battles that they fought, including propaganda that they used to try to defeat the enemy. Well, don't feel bad for the enemy. They were doing the same thing to them, you understand. That's all part of war. That's what goes on. But all oh, the power of these words... Now, he considers then what he wants God to do. For he says, what shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee? Speaking of the deceitful tongue and the lying lips, here's what he wants. Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Arrows that would sling back. Now, he's not talking about shooting them. He's asking the Lord to deliver him. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you think of the coals, just go over with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. You remember the vision that Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter 6 when he got to see the Lord high and lifted up. He heard the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, the scripture says in verse 5, after he saw that, it says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, 
For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Now get this. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. Why? Well, according to what he says next, was to cleanse those lips. He's praying for the arrows of the mighty to be shot at the lying lips, at the deceitful tongue, and that a coal be applied to cleanse those lips. You know, it's amazing how much people can get away with with their mouth and never have to face any ramifications for it. Yeah, he's in trouble. And in this trouble that he's going through, uh, he doesn't have any defense but the Lord. And he cries out in verse 5, Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesek, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. Now, Meshach and Kedar, real places, but also a figure of speech for the ungodly and unholy people. It was a description of the people living in northern Arabia. Their words, their tongues. I don't know about you, but there are places in this country I really don't want to be. I'm glad God hasn't called me to those places. I would hate to live daily in Washington, D.C. Can you imagine having to hear that mess every day, every day, every day, wickedness? Uh, I, we know what's going to be said tomorrow. Everybody knows what's going to be said tomorrow because nobody is interested in truth. We're not going to give anybody credit for what they do if they do something good. As a matter of fact, we're still going to find some blame for them when they do good. That's Washington, D.C. I wouldn't want to live in San Francisco. I wouldn't want to, there's a lot of places I wouldn't want to live. I wouldn't want to live in New York. I mean, there's just a number of places I don't want to be at. Now, if God called me, I'd go tomorrow. But I don't want to go to those places. Because it is such an atmosphere. I don't want to go to Portland, Oregon. Good night. They got crazy people running the government up there. They're nuts. This, this is insanity that we're living among today. Nobody seems to have a brain. Well, I think the people that do have a brain just simply stay quiet and say, let me get on with my life. But that's rough. And basically, I'm glad I live in Alabama. Amen. We may have our own share of problems, but thank God it's not like those other places I just mentioned. Matter of fact, I don't know any place in the world right now that doesn't have some kind of problem going on. So then he says... My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, I'm sorry. You look around you today, and you can't help but see kind of a parallel in what's going on in our nation today. For instance, if you're up in Washington, D.C., it doesn't make any difference how bad you want peace or how bad you want things to go well. You know there are people hanging on every word you say. They're for war. They're for war no matter what you say. I was thinking about this as I was preparing the message. Some of you remember back, those of you that are old enough now, it's hard to believe we're that old, but when George Bush, too, had his presidency, he never would attack the Democrats. Did you ever notice that? He would not attack them. And, and the conservatives are sitting back, man, say something. Just say something. He'd take it, and they spit out just as wicked and awful things against him as they do toward our current president. It was terrible, but he was a nice guy. And so now we got a president, he says something. And a lot of conservatives are sitting there going, oh, I wish he hadn't said that. Oh, I wish he hadn't said that. Because that other group, they are so vile and so vulgar and so anti-American, they're going to do what, they're for war. That's what they want is war they're going after i'm just simply saying I, i'm not preaching against any particular political party i'm just observing and sharing my observation while i still can speak freely in this country you can't in every area of the country you're only allowed to speak what certain groups say you have a right to believe and that's it and that's un-american they need to go to a country that practices what they do anyway but they don't. They want one all for themselves. So we got trouble. He's in trouble, man. And he's facing, he's facing all this stuff coming in. So what's next? Well, all right, what am I going to do? Am I going to major on the trouble? Or am I going to trust? So notice what he says. 
I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And what he says next is powerful simply because of what creation is. For he says, which made heaven and earth. Now think about that. He did all that with the word of his mouth. He did it in six days, and may I say he didn't need six days. But he did it in six days. And he did it completely, and he did it right. He created everything that is out of nothing. He's God. So I'm going to look unto the one who has all power to do all things. All these puny people that are running around, and boy, they're screaming and they're hollering about the things they don't like and all that. Well, guess what, folks? Uh, they may shake their fist at God, but according to Psalm 2, God sits in the heavens and laughs. And he has them in derision. They're going about screaming, man, save the whale, save the bird, save the owl, kill the people. And God sits in heavens and laughs. I don't think he spends a whole lot of time fretting about the things they have to say. Because he is all powerful. And the psalmist says, I'm going to lift up my eyes and look on the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Then he says in verse 3, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Now, you just stay hid in him. And listen, those people can't touch you. They can't knock you out. And by the way, he's not going to fall asleep. They can't come in at night and surprise God. Can't do it. God knows what's going on, and God watches over you. You can trust him. That's who he's going to trust. That's who the psalmist is going to trust. Now, I'm going to trust the Lord to take care of this thing. Whatever new thing may, they may come up with tomorrow, let's just trust the Lord. Let's praise his name. He goes on to say, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. You notice he doesn't say he that kept Israel. He that keepeth Israel. He's still keeping Israel today. If you want one miracle, you want to prove God uh, deity in one miracle, the fact that there's still Jews around. Because the world has done its best to wipe them out. Over the centuries, it seems like every man's hand has been against them. And they've done their best to wipe them out. They can't do it. You know why? He keepeth them. That's why. He made promises to Israel, and he's not going to let the devil's crowd get the best of them. Now, believe me, if an Israelite dies without Jesus, they die and go to hell. They're not going to heaven because they're Israelites. But he has, a pro he has more than one promise to the nation, and he's going to fulfill it. And we're going to say more about that when we get to Psalm 122. But notice in his trust, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Now, I have reached that age in my life. I used to enjoy the sunshine, being out in the sunshine. But I've discovered if I'm out in the sunshine too much, I start getting dizzy. Do we have any old people have that trouble? Anybody else? Oh, yeah, there's a few of you. Well, really, uh, there's a few of you that have got that problem. There's just something about it. I was out playing golf the other day, got to about hole 15, and, you know, I'd have to, when I got out of the golf cart, I'd have to stand there for a little bit and just get my bearings and then walk up. Bending over, man, it comes on real quick sometimes. You know, bend over, stand back up. Just, I'm just glad I can get back up. Glad that happened. But it's amazing how the sun just saps you. Well, now guess what? It's something as powerful as the sun. He says here, The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. That's pretty good preservative right there. Because he's the one who's going to do it. Let me give you a side thought for just a moment. I've heard people say, you know, one of the reasons why there is so much sickness out there is all these preservatives in our food. Anybody heard that? Okay, you may believe that, and that's fine if you do. But I got news for you. Before they came up with those preservatives in our food, our longevity table for how long the average American lived is only about 57 years per person. And now it's up over 70. I think that has to do with all the preservatives we got in our food. It's preserved us. 
You say, then why all the disease? I'll tell you why all the disease. Because we're living longer, and older people get disease a lot earlier. I'm just thinking, I'm just, I look around and I observe. If all this stuff is so bad for us, why are we living longer? There's another reason, and that's to pay the doctors. But anyway, he says, so the Lord shall preserve thee, but notice this, from all evil. And he shall preserve thy soul. I thank God for the eternal security of the believer. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this one thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can count on him. He preserves his people. All right, this is something that we've not faced before in our lifetime. But may I say, other Christians have faced a whole lot worse. And God has preserved them and God has kept them and he will keep us. Yes, he's preserved Christians that have gone through national turmoil and upheaval. He's still taking care of his people. And he will take care of us. Verse 8, the Lord shall preserve thy going out, thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So he stated his trouble, his trouble not dealing with swords and spears, but literally with words that were an attack. And he's made his prayer to the Lord about it. And he's made his declaration, I am going to seek the Lord. Now, when you have steadfastly made your proclamation that your stance is going to be with God, it's a time for victory. And I love the way this starts out. You get to 122, and he starts out by saying, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, we need the house of the Lord for a number of reasons. Yeah, I know we can worship God anywhere, but we also need to worship him in the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord, we're going to hear the word of the Lord. You'll remember, of course, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he says of the church, he says the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what it is if it walks according to this word. It starts varying from the word and teaching other things as fact. Instead of what God says in his word, then we'd have to say with God, let God be true and every man a liar. We're going to stand on God's word. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Yeah, I like being with God's people. I love fellowshipping with God's people. I love worshiping with God's people. I love singing with God's people. I love all of that. I'm glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We got a little taste there for a couple weeks when we only had church on live streaming. And boy, it was exciting just to be back together for the drive-in service. It's just, it was exciting to see people driving by in their car and sitting next to you uh, across in their car and being able to see one another. That was a blessing just to be with God's people. I think God, it's one of the reasons God brought it on is to remind us we've taken so much for granted and we've treated the holy things as light things and he's made us think a little heavier about this stuff. Notice he says, oh, by the way, it begins with the house of the Lord, this psalm does, and it ends with, look at verse 9, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. So this psalm begins with the house of the Lord, it ends with the house of the Lord. And in between we see the triumph. Now, he starts, first of all, as I said in verse 1, we see a hard attitude. And then he says this, our feet shall stand within thy gates. What does he say? Oh, Jerusalem. I got news for you. Jerusalem is special to God. Now, I know that this one here is a psalm of David, and Jerusalem was special to David. It's going to be special to Jesus, by the way, too, because he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem during the time of the millennium for a thousand years. It's special. He's still got promises for Israel concerning Jerusalem. That stuff hasn't ended. It's still there. He says, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes uh, go up, the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel to give thanks under the name of the Lord. Man, how many times has Israel been kicked out? And each time they were kicked out, they were kicked out because of their own sin. Whether they got kicked out by, uh, by the Babylonians, 
And then 70 years later, were brought back into Jerusalem when they rebuilt the temple. And then the next group came in. They rebuilt the walls. That's what Nehemiah did to protect the city. But then they didn't stay right very long. And guess what? They got kicked out again. Oh, how they looked for the time of coming back. God has not ended his promises for them. This is special. He says, this is the place where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord under the testimony of Israel. Then he says in verse, um, and by the way, they go up to give thanks under the name of the Lord. Verse 5, for there are set thrones of judgment and thrones of the house of David. Jerusalem, the place where his judgment takes place. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, the scripture says that he will rule with a rod of iron. There's not going to be any chop zones there, not going to be any porno zones, no bar zones, no strip joint zones, nothing like that at all in Jerusalem. When Jesus rules, he will rule with a rod of iron. He will rule in righteousness. That's what he will do. That's still in the future. That's coming. He says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Have you done that? I don't see anywhere where he's taken that command away. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's still a divided city. Matter of fact, it's amazing how they gave the land to Israel, the countries that got together back in 1948. And since then, they've cut it up a bunch of times to give to others. Well, I got news for you. When Jesus comes back, he's not cutting it up for the others. Promise is still true. This is victory here. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. That's triumph. All the promises of God will be fulfilled. So we see the trouble he was in, his trust in the Lord, and we see the triumph. God's still going to fulfill all of his word to his people. And he's going to fulfill all his word to us, just exactly like he stated. Hey, Israel is going to be grafted back in. The Bible's plain about that in the book of Romans. In the meantime, by the way, God's never stopped saving Jews. I want you to understand that. God's never stopped saving Jews. He, they're saved Jews today. Paul was a saved Jew. So was Peter. So was Stephen. He's still saving Jews. And thank God he's still saving Gentiles. Hallelujah. Of which I am one. So you say, preacher, all right, what are some of the lessons then that we get from this? Let me give you four lessons from these three psalms put together in that way. Number one, you can talk to the Lord about anything, especially your enemies and your trials. You can talk to the Lord about anything. The Bible says in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. When you get in trials, he ought to be the first one you talk to. And talk to him about your enemies. I mean, we've already read in a couple of the Psalms of David where he asked the Lord to break the teeth of his enemies. You can talk to God. So talk to him. You say, well, it would be wrong if I... If I, if I prayed that, well, I think God would rebuke you for it if, if it was wrong. I don't believe David was wrong when he prayed that way. The Holy Spirit put it in there for us. But you can talk to the Lord about your enemies. Now, I think most of us, and most of the time, being good Christians, we're going to ask God to get them right. If they'll get right, then they'll ask forgiveness from you down the road. Number two. Claim his promises even in the darkest of times and rejoice. I'm not saying things are going to get better soon. As a matter of fact, things may get a whole lot worse before they get a whole lot better. What should we do? Claim the promises of God and rejoice. That's what we do. Claim the promises of God and rejoice. You remember when Moses was called at the burning bush and when God sent Moses, first of all, to Israel to tell them that God had sent them to go to Pharaoh, sent him uh, to them to then go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. 
And so, fine, Moses, go and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. He went to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't let him go. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh talked to the headmasters of those slaves, the Jews, and he put more work on them. So now when Moses comes back, his own people are mad at Moses. They're not mad at Pharaoh. They're mad at Moses for going and disturbing everything. So Moses then goes to the Lord. What's going on? Well, now, wait a second. God told him that Pharaoh wasn't going to let him go. God told them that he was going to have to pour his power out upon, upon Egypt. God told them that it was happening exactly like God said, but he hadn't been paying attention to every part of it. Now think about this. How would God have gotten more glory? The way he did it, by bringing the ten plagues upon Egypt, by parting the Red Sea, drowning the Egyptian army in the Red Sea while God's people went across on dry ground, or would he have gotten more glory if Moses would have went strumming into Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, yeah, I'm kind of tired of them anyway. Let them go. Just go on. Get out of here. You bother us. I'll tell you who they would have been praising. They would have been praising Moses. Not God. God got the glory by the way he did it. You understand if things have to get darker before they get better, God's going to get glory. And it ought to be our desire that he get the glory. Amen. By the way, you remember, uh, well, let me give you the third thing, the third lesson. Remind yourself of the promises of God. In Psalm 121, he reminds himself of the promises of God over and over again. This is where you need to spend time with the Lord and repeating out loud, Lord, I thank you that you've promised this and give scripture, and I thank you that you've promised this and give scripture. You need to hear yourself praising the Lord, and you need to remind yourself again of the promises of the Lord. Man, God's with us. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. All right, claim that promise. That even in the darkest of night, even in the hardest of times, our God's not going to leave us. We can trust him. Then a fourth lesson. Learn to love what is special to God. I mean, after all, his house is special to God. Learn to love what's special to God. Israel's special to God. His people is special to God. When I say his people, I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about Israel. The saints are special to God. Learn to love what's special to God. You know, the reality is, it's gotten so we're not very good at loving the brethren, the ones that irritate us. We're just not real good about that. Loving the brethren. Now, love is not a feeling. Love is action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Husbands of your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it. He loved me and gave himself for me. You see, love is action. It says nothing about having a feeling. It's about doing love. Love. So we need to love what's special to God. Find out the scripture what's special to God. I believe his word is special to him. The Bible says he's magnified his word above his name, Psalm 138. Well, good night. We ought to be magnifying his word as well. His word is true. His word is infallible. It's a light unto my feet. It's a lamp to my, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Man, his word, what would we do without the word of God? Love. Matter of fact, that's where we get the promises of God. Love the things that God loves. I don't care how dark the night, we are to be a victory people because the God of heaven, the only one there is, is our God. His word is true. His promises are true. He'll keep his word to us. This life here is only temporary. The eternal is ours by his great power and might. And that ought to be enough for his people. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, encourage our hearts tonight. And Lord, may we make sure we encourage our own hearts too. 
by recounting your promises, by recounting your word, by rejoicing in the promises that we have in you and the privilege we have to see you work in our midst. God, do a great work in our lives, for I ask it in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. How many can say tonight, by simply raising your hand, well, thank God, preacher, if I died right now, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'd go to heaven and praise the Lord. Would you lift your hand up as a testimony of the Lord? Do you know you're saved? Know you're going to heaven? God bless you. Thank you. Put them down. If you couldn't raise your hand, you can have salvation in Jesus Christ. That's why he went to the cross of Calvary, why he shed his blood. He died for you, paid your sin debt, rose three days later from the dead, and will give eternal life to you if you trust him. If there's someone right now who would say, Preacher, I don't know if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up where I could see it and put it back down? I'd like to pray for you. I'm not going to come to you and embarrass you. There might be someone at home right now over the Internet. You're watching. You don't know if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. Why don't you call us? Simply call our church number, 256-830-6224. We have someone standing by who'd be glad to take the word of God over the phone, share with you how you can have Christ as Savior. Perhaps as a Christian tonight, you say, Preacher, I've just been so discouraged. I've been so down. And I needed this tonight in my life. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Would you do that? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yeah, I know the trials can get pretty heavy. Pray for me. Anybody else? Yes. All right, Lord. You have your way now in our lives. Blessing the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. As we sing a couple verses of Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way, you need to come, come on.